Hello and welcome to Lesson 27 in our study of denominational doctrines. The last class we were talking about false doctrines concerning the church, and I want to review just a little bit before we get started. We pointed out how some hold a false view that one church is just as good as another. Well, that's false. Of course, what they're doing, they're trying to look at the Lord's church from the standpoint of being all these denominations. But the Lord's church is not comprised of denominationalism. Therefore, the view is false. He built one church. Then some have the attitude that church, uh, Jesus, yes, the church, no. Well, again, they misunderstand the importance of the Lord's church and the fact that Jesus died for the church. Then some believe that all churches comprise the one true church. They misused John 15. We covered that and we showed that that was false. Then some hold the view that Alexander Campbell established the Church of Christ. We illustrated that that's false. And if Alexander Campbell established any church, it would be wrong. Then John the Baptist, they say, established the church. We pointed out that could not be the case. Then notice, some do not realize that the church and the kingdom are one and the same. We gave proof to illustrate that they are indeed one and the same. Then some believe that the church is the building. Well, the church is not the building. We illustrated that with various verses. Then some say, well, if you're going to know you're a member of the one true church, you've got to trace it all the way back, church secession, one right after another, until you get back to the day of Pentecost. Well, that's false, because we illustrated that the Word of God is the seed, you plant the seed in good and honest hearts, it will produce simply Christians, members of the church you read about in the Bible. Now today we want to start with the fact that some say that one can be saved outside the church. Friends, there is no salvation outside of the Lord's church for responsible people today. That just absolutely will not happen, and they misunderstand again the very nature of the church as opposed to the world. We'll come back to that in a moment, but let me read you some statements from the Baptist. Salvation, therefore, does not include church membership or even baptism, but salvation will lead to both. See, you become saved, and if you want to be baptized, all right. Or if you want to go down here and find you a church to join, that's all right, according to them. But it's not all right, given what the Word of God says. The same process that makes you a child of God is the process that causes God to add you to the Lord's church. Then notice this quote from the Baptist. We do not join the church to be saved but because we are saved. Again, notice they are trying to disjoin the church from salvation. So the Baptist man said, look, you don't have to go out here and join the church to be saved. No, you join it because you are. Well, you don't join it, period. You simply obey the gospel of Christ and the Lord adds you to the church, Acts 2, 47. Now, as we think about the chart again we saw a moment ago, showing that there's only two places that responsible people can be. Folks, you're either in the world and thus lost, or else you're in the church and saved. Now, when you become a child of God, the Lord takes you out of the world and places you into his family, the church. The word church comes from a Greek word, ekklesia, which means the called out. Called out of what? Called out of the world. Well, if you're called out of the world, you've got to be placed somewhere. Where in the world are you going to be placed? The only place that the Lord is going to put you is in his family, namely the church. In Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, we've illustrated clearly already that the church and the kingdom are one and the same. But now, look at Acts 2, verse 47. Praise in God and have in favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Notice, if you are such as should be saved, you're no longer in the world. The Lord has added you to his church, to his family, to the kingdom, 
to the Lord's body. So people, when they become confused and believe, well, the church is not important, they're confused because they're looking at it from the concept, uh, concept of denominationalism. See, they look out here at these various churches, denominations, and they reason this way. Well, now, I'd be all right if I wasn't a Baptist. Well, that's true. Well, I'd be okay if I wasn't a Methodist. Well, that's true. Well, I'd be all right if I wasn't a Catholic. Well, that's true. Oh, I'd be okay if I wasn't a Jehovah's Witness. That's right. I'd be okay if I wasn't a Mormon. That's right. You know the reason they feel that way? Because those churches are not essential. But there is one church that is essential to your salvation and mine. And that's the church that we read about in the New Testament. The one for which Jesus Christ himself died. Now, why die for it as the Lord did? If it's not essential. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. What is the Lord going to save? He's going to save the body. What is the body? The body is the church. Ephesians 1, 22, 23. How many bodies are there. Read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, and you'll see there is not but one body. One body? Which one? The one Jesus said he would establish? Upon this rock I will build my church singular. Not churches. So my friends, when one has the attitude that one can be saved outside the church, he misunderstands the very nature of the church. Watch this. To be in the church is to be in the body. To be in the body is to be in Christ. To be in Christ is to be where all spiritual blessings can be found, Ephesians 1, verse number 3. Now, can you be saved without being in Christ? Why, no, because all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Well, if you're in Christ, where are you? You're in his body. If you're in his body, what is that? The body is the church. So you've got to be in the church, in the body, in order to be saved. And, friends, it's sad that preachers and creeds and so forth have promoted this concept that the church is not important, that you can be saved outside the church, which just absolutely is not the case. Now, let's look at the, uh, the truth about the church. It's very important that you understand, and I understand, the truth about the church. We hear a lot of error about it, but we want to look at the truth about it. The pattern for the church is found in the Word of God, not in creed books, not in what some man has come up with. The true church is great and must have certain identifying characteristics. Now, we'll get into this a little bit more. But we want to notice something here about these identifying characteristics. Suppose that you do not know the kind of car that I drive. But I want you to go pick up the, my car for me. So I say, here are the keys. And I say, my car is a maroon Corsica 1989 model, license tag number 291KIV. And then I tell you that on the aerial wire, it's got a green ribbon. And then on one of the windows, it's got a sticker, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. And I give you the keys and I say, please go get my car for me. All right, when you get out there and you see a gray Corsica, you know that's not it. Or you see a maroon Cadillac, you know that's not it. Why? Because it's not meeting the identifying characteristics that I have told you. But when you see that Corsica, when you see that green ribbon, when you see the license tag number is correct, when you see the sticker on the window, before you ever take the key and stick it in the door, you know it's going to unlock it. Why? Because it has all of the identifying characteristics. Same way with the Lord's Church. It has certain identifying characteristics. Established in Jerusalem, 33 A.D. Established by the Lord and the inspired apostles. It has the right plan of salvation. It has the right system of worship. It has the right organization. 
It has the right moral code and the right standard. Now, when you get all these things and they meet the characteristics found in the Word of God for the Lord's church, then you know you've found the New Testament church. But now, if you run upon a church, as I did, that was established in Cleveland, Tennessee, you know it's not the right one or Salt Lake City, Utah, or any other place. So then we got to have all of the identifying characteristics for it to be the true New Testament church. Well, the Lord's church has got to follow the right pattern that's found in the Bible. So this is a matter of Bible authority. When you find the right pattern, it'll have all these characteristics. But let's notice the greatness of the Lord's church and what makes it great. It's great, number one, because it was planned. It was no accident. It was planned. Ephesians 3, 10 and 11. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purposes which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice the church was in the manifold wisdom of God in his eternal purpose. We'll talk about premillennialism a little bit later. But you know those who believe premillennialism, they believe the church was an accident, that it really wasn't planned. No, the Bible teaches that it was in the eternal purpose and wisdom of God Almighty. That's one thing that makes it great. Number two, it's great because it existed in prophecy. The prophets knew that this kingdom, this church was going to be established. When you read Daniel 2, Isaiah 2, and other prophecies, you can see that these men knew by inspiration that there was a coming kingdom. Now, I want to share some verses with you that are so, so important. In 1 Chronicles 17, beginning with verse number 11, the Bible says, And it shall come to pass, when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers. Now, Nathan's talking to David that I will raise up of thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. Notice, if you will, the kingdom is going to be established of the seed of David. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And I will not take my mercy away from him, as I took it from him that was before thee. But I will settle him in mine house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forevermore. According to all these words, and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. All right, now what did you say, Nathan? Nathan said, David, when you're dead and gone, when thy days be expired, one is going to be raised up by the Lord of your seed, from your loins. God will place him on your throne. He will have a kingdom that will last forever, that will not be taken away from him. Now, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter was preaching, he says this in Acts 2, beginning with verse number 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. Wait a minute, Peter. You could say that about a lot of men. You could say that about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job. You know, just a whole lot of men. How come you say this relative to David? Because of the prophecy. This is the prophecy in Chronicles being fulfilled. So notice he says that David is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, that's what Nathan said, according to the flesh, that's what Nathan said, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, that's what Nathan said. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So notice, here is the fulfillment of that prophecy, and Peter takes 
the prophecy made by Nathan to David and says that Jesus Christ fulfilled that and the church or the kingdom has thus been established. Well, next, notice, the Lord's church is great because of its divine origin. It was not established by some uninspired man. It was established by the Lord and by inspired men. In Hebrews 3, verse number 4, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Every house is built by some man. Now, I know this. When I see the Baptist church, I know somebody established it. When I see the Methodist church, I know somebody established it. When I see the Jehovah's Witnesses, I know somebody had to establish that group. When I see the Lutherans or the Mormons or the Presbyterians or whoever, I know somebody had to establish those various groups. But my friends, the Lord's church is great because it is of divine origin. It did not have its origin with some uninspired man. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 127, verse number 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Now notice, if the Lord didn't build the house, they labor in vain that build it. We've used these verses over and over to try to establish that point, but let me use them again. In Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now verse 22, Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in thy name? Haven't we done many wonderful works in thy name? And then will I profess unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. You know what? They labored in vain. And that's what the Bible here says. You try to build a house, try to build upon a foundation that is not scriptural, all you get is vanity. It's useless. It's void. It won't help you. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Mark 7, 7. So one thing that makes the Lord's church great it's not started or established by uninspired men, but it is of divine origin. Upon this rock I will build my church. Then notice, the Lord's church is great because of the tremendous price that was paid for it. Boy, you just think about what it cost Jesus to pay for his church and to establish his church. Acts twenty twenty eight. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Notice the Lord's church is great because Jesus Christ was willing to die for the Lord's church. That's what makes the church great. The price that was paid for it. We've mentioned it before, but how in the world can you look at the price that was paid for the Lord's church and then conclude... It's not important. You know, really not essential. No, it's very important, very essential, given the Lord's view of it. Not necessarily man's, but the Lord's. In Ephesians 5:25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Notice the Lord gave himself for the church. That's how important it is. So we know the greatness of the New Testament church because of the price that was given for it. Then next, notice the church is great because of its head. You know, some people, they boast when they have somebody over a company or, or something like that they think is very important. Think about Jesus Christ being the head of the Lord's church. And then someone say, well, it's not important. Sure it's important. Watch Ephesians 1, 22, 23. And it put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, 
the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So notice Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Now, what good is the head if he has nothing to be head over? He is head over the body. He is the head over the church. Now, here's the head trying to control something, and then these denominational preachers tell us, why, it's not important that there be anything down here to control. Yes, the body is very important. Can you imagine me having a head but no body, and me trying to tell you the head's important, but I don't need the body? Yes, I need the body. And so spiritually, the head and the body go together. You can't separate the two. Jesus Christ, the head, the church, the body. Then notice the church is great because it is governed by divine law. You know, uh, I've mentioned time and time again about the various creed books. I've even read to you during this study from creed books. You have various churches governed by this creed book or that creed book. Or you have maybe something like a pope or a council that's over the various churches. Let me tell you something. The Lord's church is great because it's governed by divine law. The inspired, inerrant, perfect will of God. In Hebrews 7.12, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Notice, this law governs the Lord's church. The law has been changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Why? So that Jesus Christ can serve as your high priest and my high priest. Because, you see, he couldn't have been the high priest under Old Testament law. So it's very important that the law be changed. And again, what's amazing here, we have those who have the attitude, we're not under any law. We're strictly under grace. Well, listen, the Bible says the law of Moses came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and truth, my friends, are not mutually exclusive, as some would have you believe. Grace and truth go hand in hand. In Hebrews 1, beginning with verse number 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now notice the church is governed by divine law. Now, what value is there that the Son speaks if the Son governs, governs nothing? He governs the Lord's church. He governs mankind. In Matthew 17, 5, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. A voice from heaven on the Mount of Transfiguration, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Him, the Lord's church is great because it is governed by divine law. Then notice the Lord's church is great because of its mission. Well, what is the mission of the church? I think some people think it's to entertain and, and to do all these social things. No, the mission of the church is to teach the lost, teach the saved, and benevolence. Help those that cannot help themselves. And even that in a view of trying to teach them. Now notice Matthew 28, beginning with verse number 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Notice, teach all nations, teach the lost. That's the mission of the church. Then teach the saved. Acts 20:28. 20, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. Notice then, the church of our Lord is to be fed. Fed what? Fed the inspired word of God. And so then the elders have the awesome responsibility of seeing to it that the congregation is fed the very thing that it needs. And then you've got benevolence. Here's someone I hear that cannot help him or herself. They don't have sufficient clothing or food, whatever the case might be. Listen to James 1.27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, 
to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Notice here you got the fatherless, you got the widows that need help. What is pure religion? Administering to their needs, seeing whatever it is that they need, and try to come through for them. That's pure and undefiled religion. Well, the Lord's church is also great because of its destiny, where it's going when all is said and done. And, of course, the whole purpose of where it's going is that the saved have been added to it, so eventually the Lord will come and save it and take it into eternity so that all who were in the body can be with God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, and all the saints of days gone by in all eternity in heaven. When you read John 14, beginning with verse number 1, the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. See, the Lord has gone to prepare a place for us. But heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And you and I got to make sure that we prepare ourselves, that we leave the world to become a part of God's family. The ecclesia, the called out ones. Called out where? Called out of the world to be placed into the church. In Ephesians 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Notice he's going to save the body. But what is the body? We've already mentioned. The body is the church. Ephesians 1, 22, 23. In 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. Notice the day is coming when the kingdom is going to be delivered up to the Father. And when the kingdom is delivered up to the Father, then all who are in that glorious kingdom will get to be with the Father in all eternity. So the church is great because of its destiny, where it's going. Now notice the true church will be right in various things. It will be right in origin, organization, the head, the headquarters. You know, I have people say to me, where in the world is the headquarters of the church of Christ? And I say, well, it's in heaven. Heaven? That's the only headquarters you got? That's right. Well, that's the only one we need when Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Then the church will have to be right in the plan of salvation. See, we have these various churches teaching various plans of salvation, such as faith only, come to the mourner's bench, and so forth. Common sense will tell you that cannot be right. But the plan of salvation in the Bible is the one by which men must live. When I say common sense to tell you that cannot be right, you can't read about it in the Bible. Well, the worship's going to have to be right, the work, the moral code that one endorses. Like I asked that Baptist preacher, can I commit adultery with all the women in Bristol and kill everybody I come into contact with, steal everything I see, and be right in the sight of God. And you know what he told me? He said, yeah, you can do that if you're among the elect and still go to heaven. No, the moral code has got to be right. Discipline, practicing church discipline within the body of Christ is a must. The standard going strictly by the Bible, our devotion, our love, all of these things are identifying characteristics of the New Testament church. You know, I used the illustration a moment ago of my car and showed you if I gave to you the keys and gave you certain identifying characteristics to my car, you'd be able to go and find it. Well, same way here. The Lord doesn't want you to be lost. He doesn't want me to be lost. So he has given certain identifying characteristics to the New Testament church so that when I do what the New Testament teaches relative to these identifying characteristics, I can know when I'm a member of the one true church and thus be saved. Well, let's notice that Christianity is non-denominational. 
You know, the people out in the world cannot get this into their precious minds. We love them, but they just can't understand it. How that you can be a member of a church that is not a denomination. And again, let me ask a very important question. Is the Lord's church here anywhere upon the face of the earth, separate and apart from denominationalism? Now, friends, if you say no, then you're under a God-given obligation to make sure that you help return to the Bible and become just a Christian, thus allow the Lord to add you to his church so that the church will be here. Now, if you say, yes, the Lord's church is here, separate and apart from denominationalism, then come out of man-made churches and be just a Christian. Be a member of the church you read about in the Bible. Let us notice some contrast between denominationalism and Christianity. Number one, denominationalism promotes many bodies or many churches. They even say one church is just as good as another. But notice the Bible says there's not but one body or one church. Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I will build my church. Also 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20. Denominations are established by men. But the New Testament church was founded by Christ. Again, Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I will build my church. With denominationalism, you've got human heads. But with the New Testament church, Jesus Christ is the head of his church, Ephesians 1, 22, 23. With denominationalism, you've got human creeds. You know, we've talked about the various creeds. I've read to you from some of these creeds. As a matter of fact, when you get a set of the notes, there'll be all kinds of quotes from various creeds, books, and so forth within the notes. But now, when it comes to Christianity, we are to go strictly by the Word of God. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Well, denominations, they wear human names, such as Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians, Catholics, and so forth. But you know, the Bible teaches that we are to glorify God in that beautiful name, Christian. 1 Peter 4, 16. A man told me one time he's a Methodist. He said, do you realize, Wesley, the word Christian appears only three times in the entire Bible? I said, yeah, I know that. But I said, do you realize that's three times more than the name Methodist? I wanted him to get the point. I wasn't trying to be unkind to him. I was trying to show him that one was authorized and one was not. One is of divine origin and the other is not. Well, denominations follow men. So, oh no, I, they follow the Bible. Well, if they follow the Bible, why do they wear man-made names, have man-made organizations, plans of salvation not taught in the Word of God, they worship in ways that are not authorized, thus they had to come from men. But now, the New Testament church follows Christ and teaches that following men is wrong. Well, denominationalism says churches, or these churches are unknown to the Bible. When you think about denominationalism, you don't read about a Baptist church in the Bible, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church. Like I mentioned once before, Everett Morfield says on our program, show me how to become a Baptist and I'll be one before the sun goes down. Show me how to become a Jehovah's Witness and I'll be one before the sun goes down. Now when he says show me those things, he's talking about from the Bible. Show me how to become a Mormon from the Bible and I'll be one before the sun goes down. No, you can't do that and use the Word of God because those churches are not known in the Bible. But the church mentioned in the Bible is the true church. You know, again, we're trying to call people back beyond man-made churches all the way back to New Testament Christianity. Well, membership in denominations, they say, is not essential to salvation. But membership in the Lord's church is essential to salvation. Ephesians 5, 23, the Lord is going to save the body. He adds the saved to that body. 
Acts 2, 47, and he's coming back for it. Well, denominational churches preach many different gospels. But there's only one gospel, according to the Bible. And even if an angel from heaven should preach another, he's to be a curse. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Well, denominations, they have to rewrite their creeds every now and then because they don't like what they once believed. But the Bible remains the same all the time. According to Matthew 24, 35, the word of God endures forever. Well, they believe in many different faiths. One faith is just as good as another. But the Bible says there's not but one faith, Ephesians 4, 5. They say there are many different baptisms. But the Bible says there's only one baptism, Ephesians 4, 5. They say that you can join various churches. But the Bible says you're added to the church, Acts 2, 47. Well, they claim the branches comprise all these different denominational churches. But Jesus said, no. Jesus said the branches were the individuals, and they were to be in him, according to John 15, 1 through 6. Well, denominationalism teaches that you can walk by different rules and, and different standards. But the Bible says we're to all have the same rule, the same standard, Philippians 3, 16. Some, even in denominationalism, have thanked God in their prayers for all these different churches so that one could join the one more closely aligned to his own personal beliefs. But Jesus prayed for unity, that all be one. John 17, 20, 21. Well, denominational people say doctrine is not important. But the Bible says we're to take heed to sound doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, 16. Can't you see the contrast? And these are but a few. Then let's, talk, let's think about the names for just a moment that people wear. Where are the Bible? Where's Bible authority for the different names that religious people wear? They don't have it. Notice where to wear the names that the Bible authorizes. You know, sometimes the Bible speaks of the church as being the church, the body, the body of Christ, the churches of Christ, my church, church of the Lord, kingdom, body. Church of the living God, kingdom of his dear son, flock of God, the whole family. And I've got verses down through there for each of these so that you can look them up and see some of the descriptive terms that refers to God's people. Now that's collectively, but individually, those in the Bible who were Christians were known as Christians, disciples, saints, brethren, believers, members, and children of God, and so forth. Now, friends, are we going to go with the Bible or not? Help your friends and your loved ones to see the truth on this. Come back to the Bible. Be just a Christian. When your friend or loved one or even you become just a Christian, the Lord will take you out of the world and add you to the church, add you to the kingdom of his dear son. Won't you allow the Lord to do that? And won't you allow the Lord to use you to try to help reach those who are in religious era. Oh, study hard that you can be a good servant for the Lord in this area. There are many honest people out there that's looking for the truth. Go look for them, and God will bless you in that effort. Thank you.